Imagine an act so violent that they had to invent a word to distinguish it from war, massacre, and murder. Even though this word wasn't coined until 1944 in response to the Holocaust, the act of genocide dates back to ancient times. Genocide is a crime under international law. Genocide differs from hot war or civil war in the sense that it often targets unarmed groups of people with the goal of exterminating. Moreover, what distinguishes genocide from crimes against humanity is that crimes against humanity refer to all civilian populations, whereas genocide protects specific groups of people. So this begs the question, how can we prevent genocide? The legal definition of genocide requires genocidal crimes to be accompanied with a specific intent to destroy a group. So the first step is taking preventative measures before the mass atrocities occur. Historically, most cases of genocide are foreshadowed by several signs, the most obvious being the political separation of citizens according to race, religion, ethnicity, and other social groupings. We see examples of this during World War II, when Jews in Europe were required to wear a star. In South Africa's apartheid regime, with the pencil hair test distinguishing colored from black. And in Rwanda, where a social class of Hutu or Tutsi was marked on ID cards. Moreover, the Christian, Yazidi, and Shia minorities currently targeted by the Assad regime in Syria are singled out for religious beliefs. Before the war, there was no problem between Christians and Muslims. There were no differences. We lived very well, but when the war started, and especially when ISIS arrived, the problems began for the Christians. Uh, Before the crisis, there was no persecution, but with the war and the occupation by ISIS, the problems started. Lastly, could smart water forensic asset marking residue like such being used in Hong Kong be the newest way to single out groups? By recognizing discrimination against a distinct population, one is able to spotlight regions at risk of genocide, thus increasing the world's ability to quickly react, leading us to step two, intervention. After you've identified genocide or groups at risk of genocide, there are several ways you can help end the violence, including raising awareness on social media, or writing to your elected officials to insist on responding. Creating a widespread demand for intervention is crucial, for without that pressure, those in power don't always show an interest, as displayed with America's hesitance to intervene in Rwanda. Once the consensus for intervention is established, there are several tiers of involvement countries must decide between. Although bombing perpetrators of genocide involves the least risk for intervening parties, remote actions such as airstrikes should be avoided at great costs, since they often include civilians in the collateral damage. Sadly, this was the case for the unfathomable civilian atrocities when the US bombed Syria in 2018. A better option is deploying military intervention. In the aftermath of genocidal events, force protection is necessary to ensure peace remains. For example, in the late 90s, the violence and ethnic cleansing against Muslim Albanians in the former Yugoslavia required international intervention by NATO forces. Starting in 1999, international intervention ensures NATO allies and partners work together to establish a working infrastructure and provide a safe and secure environment for the people in Kosovo. By resolving disputes between Serbians and Albanians through mediated negotiations and rebuilding relations, reconciliation is possible with hopes of a better future. Today we see traces of denial in Syria, as the Assad regime has long been denying their use of chemical weapons against civilians and Christian minorities. Genocide denial is a major obstacle in allowing a nation to heal in the aftermath of a genocide. For example, to this day, Turkey denies the classification of genocide to the events that occurred in 1915, constituting the Armenian Genocide, where over one and a half million Armenians were beaten, raped, and eventually murdered by the ethnically Muslim Ottoman Turks. This act of denying genocide has led to many future attempts by other nations to commit these crimes. Even Hitler proclaimed, and who remembers the Armenians today, when he exterminated six million Jews during the Holocaust of World War II. Genocide denial is the final step in the repeating cycle of genocide. And as so long as the nation continues to deny that they've committed these crimes, it is near impossible for there to be any sort of reconciliation between two groups or two nations. Ultimately, you might think the perpetrators of genocide to be monstrous or psychotic, but you may be surprised to find out that you'd probably be one of them. 
To elaborate, in 1963, a study conducted by psychologist Stanley Milgram researched the extent to which people would obey figures of authority, even when it meant harming another person. The setup involved shock generators that started from 15 volts with increments up to 450 volts. Volunteers were told they were taking part in scientific research to improve memory. Would you open those and tell me which of you is which, please? Teacher. Learn. Teacher. At 150 volts of shock, the actor demanded to be released from the experiment. Wrong. Unrep 50 volts. Answer, horse. Oh. Experiment, that's all. Get me out of here. Get me out of here, please. Continue, please. Go right on. I refuse to go in. Let me out. I refuse to go in. The experiment requires you continue, teacher. Please continue. Participants didn't know that the learner was really an actor and the so-called sharks harmless. Although many participants verbally protested, two-thirds continued to administer electrical shocks to the full amount. This isolated degree of obedience that persisted to the suffering of another reveals the extent to which ordinary people could succumb to carrying out genocidal orders. These results are also reflected in the aftermath of genocide, when, I was just following orders, seems to be the plea coming out of everyone's mouth. Props to the one-third who resisted authority. I'm not going to kill that man, eh? In conclusion, there are several effective ways for you to take action against genocide. By writing to our elected officials to influence legislation. Join an organization that inspires people to take action. Keep yourself informed by watching videos like this one and raise awareness by sharing news coverage on current events. Lastly, God forbid, if you're ever in that situation, be the one third that resists authority. What would you do?